Now we are ready to hear God speak through his word. I invite you to take your copy of God's word and turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, if you are using the Pew Bible provided there for you, you'll find this passage on page 958. The sad story of church history is that faithful churches often go astray under the influence of a Trojan horse. In ancient Greek mythology, the the story goes that the Greeks, uh, under their leader Odysseus, had been attempting to capture the prized city of Troy. And Troy, up until this point, had been undefeatable. And so their leader now came up with this now famous plan to build a large, hollow, wooden horse. And Odysseus, along with other soldiers, were actually inside of this hollow, wooden horse. And uh, the Greek soldiers rolled it up outside of the city of Troy, and then uh, the Greek soldiers appeared to retreat. They just kind of ran away and disappeared. And, you know, curiosity got the best of those soldiers inside of Troy, and they eventually opened the gate, and they rolled that wooden horse right inside their city gates. They'd never seen anything like that. They had to find out what was going on. And it wasn't long at the appointed time until uh, Odysseus and his soldiers emerged from this wooden horse. And then those soldiers who had appeared to retreat actually came back out ready for battle. And Greece finally conquered that prized city of Troy. Well, that's how the story goes. But one critical key to the success of Greece over the city of Troy was not necessarily the genius idea of this horse. What was equally important was that the battle had gone on, the war had gone on for nearly a decade, and they were tired of the fight, and they let their guard down. So I repeat, the sad story of church history is that faithful churches often go astray under the influence of a Trojan horse. So how can we, as we seek to be a holy church, How uh, can we continue on in the battle, not growing weary and not being captured by the vain philosophies of this age? How do we avoid letting our guard down? Well, let's hear God's word speak to us. If you've found your place in God's word and you're able, would you stand as we read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And as we've done for the last three weeks, we're going to read a larger passage of scripture, but we're going to focus in on just a few of the verses. So I begin reading in verse 12. We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. See that no one repays anyone evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Brothers and sisters, the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's pray. God in heaven, we come to you submitting to your word. We're so thankful that we have confidence that you have spoken. You have given us your perfect word and we can know how to obey you. We have everything we need for life and godliness through your word. And so may we now set aside all distractions and may we focus on your word. May we hear you speak clearly to us by the power of your spirit through your word. And it's for the glory of your son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So for the last three weeks, we've been working our way through this passage, verses 12 through uh, 22, especially. And I've been pointing out to you each week, we've been reading the big passage so that you could see that what might at first appear to be unrelated actually has a bit of order, a bit of organization to it. We've come to the end of this letter, and in some ways it feels like Paul is a preacher who's run out of time 
And he's just saying everything he can as fast as he can. He's trying to cram it in before the sermon is over. But whereas at first it may seem that there's no connection between all of these commands, we've, we've been looking at there is some order. There's a rationale to what Paul has been saying. In the first week we were in this passage, we saw the relationship between uh, the, the earthly shepherd and the sheep and how the sheep are to respond to the shepherd and how the sheep are also to respond to one another. We saw that the first week. But then last week, the emphasis uh, shifted to how uh, we as God's sheep, the, the flock of God's pasture, are to relate to him, our chief shepherd. And we saw that we're to always rejoice and always pray and always give thanks. But now this week, it, it gives us not positive commands. This is what you should do. This week, Paul gives us negative commands. This is what you should not do. And specifically, how should we relate to our chief shepherd and his word? Here's what you should not do in your daily Christian life, but more specifically, how should we relate to the chief shepherd's word? How can we avoid being defeated by a Trojan horse? Well, we'll see here in verses 19 through verse 22, just four verses, we're going to see three commands Paul gives us. And the first is there in verse 19. Don't quench the spirit. Don't quench the spirit, verse 19. Well, whose spirit is Paul referring to? Is Paul talking about us? We just read the, the blessing at the end of verses 23 and 24, and, and we've heard it. We've been uh, saying this uh, benediction at the end of the services for several weeks, and we know that Paul talks about our soul and our body and our spirit, and he's speaking about us in that verse. And so is Paul speaking about our spirit here in this verse? Is he saying that we shouldn't quench one another's spirits? No, that doesn't even make sense. The text has already told us how we're supposed to relate to one another. We just read it. We're to be at peace among ourselves and we're to admonish the idle and we're to encourage the faint hearted. We're to help the weak. We're to be patient with them all. We're to see that no one repays anyone for evil, that we always seek to do good to one another. That's the part of the passage that speaks about how we relate to one another. But how are we to relate to God himself? Paul says we don't quench the Spirit, the Spirit of the living God, the third person of the Trinity. We don't quench the Spirit and we don't stop the work that He is doing in our lives. By the way, the Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is God. The Father is God. The Son is God. We worship one God in Trinity. Whatever the Father is, whatever the Son is, the Spirit is the same stuff. The same essence. So we don't call the Spirit it. He is truly God. And the Spirit is at work in us. The night before our Lord was crucified, He told the 11 disciples that He was uh, preparing to go away. And as you can imagine, they were filled with great sorrow. But Jesus told them in John 14, 15, and 16, He said, It is to your advantage. It is for your good that I go away. For if I go away, then the Helper will come to you. If I go away, I will send him to you. Now, just like the 11 gathered there in the upper room, sometimes that's hard for us to understand. Because if you gave us the choice, would you rather have God standing beside you, yes or no, we would say yes. But Jesus has told us we have something better. We don't just have God beside us. We have God inside of us. Now, don't misunderstand. That doesn't make us little gods, as some people teach. But Christ has sent the promised Holy Spirit. And the Spirit resides inside of every single believer from the moment of repentance and belief. You're not waiting for some mystical second blessing of the Holy Spirit. You're not waiting for some elusive, ecstatic experience of speaking gibberish. You, dear Christian, have the Holy Spirit indwelling you, living inside of you. Never forget that. Never take that for granted. Well, what is the Spirit doing? Jesus taught that the Spirit would guide Christians into understanding the truth and understanding the Word of God. And the Bible teaches us that the Spirit does not draw attention to Himself. The Holy Spirit points the attention 
to Christ. The Holy Spirit seeks to glorify Christ. So any movement, any Christian who seems to emphasize the work of the Spirit over the work of Christ is missing the point. Because the Spirit is on record for saying His goal is to point us to Christ. The Spirit's desire is not to elevate Himself, but to elevate Christ. But that's not all that the Holy Spirit is doing. The Spirit is working to sanctify us, to make us more like Jesus. You remember in Romans chapter 8, the Spirit is conforming us to the image of Jesus. And what have these last two chapters in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 5 been all about? We becoming more and more like Jesus. Our sanctification, the will of God for us that we become more like Christ. Now that's an incredibly brief overview of the work of the Holy Spirit. But with his work comes a warning. And the warning is here in verse 19. Don't quench the Spirit. Don't stifle the Holy Spirit. Well, what does that mean? It's the picture of extinguishing a fire, putting out a fire. And there's several times in the Bible that the, the work of the Holy Spirit, he's referred to as being like a fire. So Paul's warning is, is actually very clear. Don't quench the work of the Holy Spirit. Don't put a wet blanket on what the Spirit is doing in you. Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1 to stir up or to rekindle the fire of the Spirit within him. So this is a warning to all believers. Even Timothy, even someone living then in the first century had to be intentional not to quench the Spirit, not to grieve the Spirit, but to stir up the work, rekindle the fire of the Holy Spirit. Well, what are some ways that we can quench the Holy Spirit? Unrepentant sin certainly quenches the work of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit is seeking to conform us to the image of Christ. And when we continue on, when we persist in known sin, we know we shouldn't be doing it, but we refuse to repent. We refuse to quit. We are certainly quenching. We are stifling. We're extinguishing the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives and even possibly in the lives of those around us. And honestly, that, that covers it all. When we say that the sin in our lives suffocates the work of the Holy Spirit among us. But actually, probably the most common way that most Christians quench the Spirit is found in the very next verse. In our second command, we see in verse 20. Our second point is don't despise the word. Verse 20 says, don't, do not despise prophecies. Don't despise prophecies. In our relationship with Christ, who is the chief shepherd, and in our relationship with him and his words, we are not to quench the spirit and we're not to despise the word. Now, I don't know what comes to your mind when you hear the word prophecy. Perhaps you think of the uh, prophets of the Old Testament and the books that bear their name, like Daniel and Isaiah and Micah. Perhaps you go a different direction and you think about psychics and charlatans today who are attempting to predict the future. But at its very essence, the word for prophecy in the Bible means to speak before, to speak before. And the work of the prophet is to speak before, and he does it in two different ways. He does it by foretelling and forthtelling. Now listen carefully to the difference. Foretelling means that the prophet announces something in advance of it actually happens. He actually speaks before it happens. That may be what we most often think of concerning the work of a prophet. We often think of a prophet being something kind of like a holy fortune teller. That they tell us what's going to happen before it happens. And that happens some in the Bible. That's part of the work of the prophet in the Bible. But that was not necessarily the most common thing that the biblical prophets did. You see, the majority of the speaking before that a biblical prophet was to do was to speak before an audience, to speak to the people, to stand before the crowd and to announce, thus says the Lord. God has spoken and this is his message. Now in those days, a, a town crier or a herald would go out and he would announce a message from the king. And his words carried the same authority as if the king was standing there before the people. 
So when the prophet of God spoke, he spoke with the authority of God himself. Sometimes the prophet announces a new message from God. Sometimes the prophet reminds the people. He points back to a message that God has already given. Let me give you two examples. Hopefully that will make it a bit clearer. Both examples coming from the life of Simon Peter. Now Jesus himself, who of course is the perfect prophet, he foretold that Peter would deny Christ three times. We know that the Bible makes clear that Peter did exactly that. And in the process of Peter cowardly denying Christ, he was actually fulfilling prophecy. The prophecy that Christ had spoken beforehand that this would happen. But then, less than two months later, Peter gives us another example of prophecy. Peter stands before a crowd of thousands of people on the day of Pentecost, and he quotes from the Old Testament, and he explains the significance of the text. He spoke before the crowd about what God had already said. You say, that sounds a lot like preaching. You're on to something. Hang on to that. We'll come back to that in just a minute. Hebrews 1 tells us that long ago, in many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. Christ is the perfect prophet, the perfect revelation of God. What more can he say than to you he has said? God has spoken. The work of the prophets of old, it's complete. You have their testimony right there in your hands. All that you need for life and godliness is found between Genesis and Revelation. But you say, Pastor, I really want to hear from a prophet today. I want to hear a fresh word from the Lord. Dear friend, if it's a fresh word from the Lord, it's not actually from the Lord. God has spoken and the Bible is complete. It will not be added to. As so many people have pointed out before me, if it's new, it's not true. And if it's true, it's not new. We don't need a fresh word from God. We need the ancient scriptures, the ancient words of God. We don't need anyone with a new word from God. We need faithful men preaching the timeless word of God. You see, that's how this gift of prophecy is manifested today. Preaching and proclaiming the word of God. You hold the complete prophecy of God in your hands. So go proclaim it. Go tell someone what God has actually already said. Brothers and sisters, I want to encourage you to be aware. Beware of anyone who comes to you and they begin their message by saying, God told me to tell you dot, dot, dot. I don't care what follows after that. When somebody says, God told me to tell you, you need to close your ears and grab your wallet. Because they are up to no good, okay? If the message is from God, it's already in the Bible. And therefore, their prophecy is not needed. Now, Peter, who's an actual biblical prophet, here's what Peter said. He said, we did not follow cleverly devised myths. We have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you would do well to pay attention. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That's 2 Peter chapter 1. Brothers and sisters, God has spoken. He's given us the complete word that we need here in the Bible. We don't need new prophecies today. God has given us all that we need in his word. If you want to hear God speak, read the Bible. If you want to hear God speak out loud, read the Bible out loud. That'll hit some of you a little bit later. A pastor uh, up in Michigan, a man named Michael Riley, he puts this issue of prophecy in perspective. He says, if God has not spoken, then there is no greater audacity than to claim to speak for God. But if God has spoken, there is no greater audacity than to refuse to hear what God has said. 
I hope I've made it really clear that I believe that God has spoken. Do we have the audacity to refuse to hear what he has said? Do not despise prophecies. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Do not reject. Do not scorn the prophecies of God. The Old and New Testament that you hold in your hands. Don't look down on the Bible. Don't look down on God's word as if it means nothing. As if it's not effective. As if it can, uh, it can save us. It can get us to heaven. But it can't really deal with the problems here in this life. The Bible is sufficient. Don't look down on the public reading and the preaching of God's word as if it is a waste of time. God has spoken. Now, I can read some of your minds. You're saying, come on, pastor. We're Baptists. We're the people of the book. We love the Bible. We're not in danger of despising God's word. Are we? Paul has already warned us that when we neglect the word of God, we are quenching the spirit of God. So therefore, when we do that, we are indeed despising God's word. When we ignore the parts of scripture that we know speak directly to our circumstances, but we just don't like what they have to say, we're despising God's word. If we're trying to live the Christian life without actually using the Bible, actually having the Bible as part of our life, without actually reading the Bible at all, then we are despising the Word. Dear friends, stop despising the Word today. Take delight in God's Word today. If we're not to quench the Spirit, and we're not to despise the Word, and we would probably all say we don't want to do that. We don't want to fall victim uh, to a Trojan horse, but we're not quite sure. Then what are we supposed to do? Well, verses 21 and 22, our third point, tell us to be discerning. Be discerning. Verses 21 and 22. Paul writes, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. So we sum up this last aspect of our relationship between Christ and his word and, and how we're to relate to it. We understand that we must be discerning. One of the greatest needs of the Christian church today is to be discerning. A holy church will be a discerning church. Well, what does it mean to discern? Well, to put it simply, to discern is to know the difference. To know the difference. Let me give you a, a, a negative example, a picture of what discernment is not. Babies and toddlers, they're not discerning. You can give a baby marshmallows, you can give them gravel from the parking lot, they don't really care. It's all going straight to their mouth, okay? That's a picture of a lack of discernment. Babies and toddlers don't know how to discern. But Christians, we must be discerning. We must be able to know the difference between the truth of the Scriptures and all other imposters. If we're to avoid quenching the Spirit, and we're to avoid despising the Word and instead taking delight in the Word, then we must know the difference. We must be discerning. You see, a farmer ought to know the difference between a bull and a steer. An electrician ought to know the difference between a fuse and and a circuit breaker. A banker ought to know the difference between a stock and a bond. And a preacher of the gospel ought to know the difference between the truth and an almost truth. You see, it's not enough to just be able to look at the truth and to know its polar opposite lie. Because most of us are not going to be led astray by something that's completely opposite of the truth. We're going to be led astray by something that's almost true. Charles Spurgeon is often quoted as saying, discernment is not a matter of simply telling the difference between right and wrong. Rather, it is telling the difference between right and almost right. You see, this goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden, does it not? When the serpent spoke to the woman and the woman replied, she said, God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. That sounded good. It was almost right. But it wasn't right. 
It wasn't what God had actually said. Another theologian named John Murray has said, the difference between truth and error is not a chasm, but a razor's edge. You see, most Christians are not going to be led astray by a lie the size of the Grand Canyon. Most of us are in danger of being confused by something that is so close to the truth that you could compare it to a hairline fracture. You might actually need help to know that the danger is even there. You see, false teachers don't come and announce that they are false teachers. Wolves don't show up in wolves' clothing. Wolves show up in sheep's clothing. So whether it's the blatant heretic who's clearly abandoned the gospel or whether it's the previously well-known pastor who you've seen on television and you know he said good things in the past, but now he says he has some new take on the gospel. How are we to respond to all of these types of situations? We're to test everything. 1 John 4, 1 tells us to test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. You see, the same way that gold is tested to see if it's really pure, we are to test all things against the word of Scripture to see if these things are actually true. The same way that trials test our faith to see if our faith is genuine, we are to test every teaching against the word of God to see if it is actually true. Do you remember when Paul preached in Thessalonica? Some were persuaded by the gospel and they joined Paul and Silas. They joined the church of Jesus Christ through repentance and faith. But that was not the majority of the people in Thessalonica. Apparently, the majority of the town remained skeptical and actually opposed violent towards Paul and company. Some came to faith in Christ and uh, this church that Paul dearly loves, we've seen that throughout this letter, that was the birth of that church there in Thessalonica. But many in the city despised the word. Many in the city quenched the work of the Spirit. The Spirit was doing among them in that city. But then Paul and Silas went immediately to Berea. Do you remember that familiar description of the Berean, the Bereans that Paul found there? Acts 17 says they received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. The Bereans were discerning Christians. The Thessalonians needed to be discerning Christians. We all need to be discerning Christians. Brothers and sisters, God will not contradict his word. If I or an angel from heaven preach to you a gospel that is contrary to what is revealed in these scriptures, let him be accursed. God will not contradict his word. We are to be discerning Christians, testing all teaching against the Bible itself. We ask the question, what has God said? Test all things. Test what you read on Facebook. Test what you hear or see on, quote, Christian radio or Christian television. Test what I say against the scriptures. Most of you have already figured this out, but I'm not perfect. I'm going to let you down at some point. But I have sought to stake my life, to build my life on the scriptures and on what God has said. So it's perfectly okay to disagree with me, but we must reason from the scriptures Measure what I say against the Scriptures. Measure what anyone says against the Scriptures. All disagreements, all arguments, all debates must be based on what God has said, not on our feelings, not on our preferences, not on our experiences. So what do we do with those test results? Paul says, hold fast what is good and abstain from every form of evil. When we test the teaching, when we test the prophecy against the word of God, we hold fast to what is good. Hold fast is a, is a key phrase in the New Testament. It always refers to the core teaching of the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2 says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast 
to the word that I preach to you. Jesus, when he was explaining the parables of the soils in Luke chapter 8, he described a true believer as those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in their heart and bear fruit with patience. Whatever is good, whatever is right, whatever is true, whatever is genuine, we should cling to that. We hold fast to that as if our very lives depended on it. But what about those things that, when tested, don't measure up to God's Word? What about those things that, when we test them, they actually contradict God's Word? What do we do with those who are found teaching doctrines that are contrary to God's authoritative Word? We abstain from every form of evil. We abstain. We've already seen this word here in 1 Thessalonians, back in chapter 4. And it's important that we remember what the word means or else we'll start trying to justify all of our favorite false teachers. And we all have a favorite false teacher. All right, let's just be honest. Because there's somebody that we know they're not saying the right thing, but we think they're funny or they tell good stories or we like their music or we like something about them and we say, I can filter that out. I can just set all that aside because I like this part of what they're doing. But God says, abstain from every form of of evil. Abstain. Do you remember in chapter 4, Paul said, abstain from sexual immorality? Abstain from it. Cut it out. Don't have anything to do with it. Don't put a little bit of rat poison in your tea in the evening. Cut it out. Don't have anything to do with it. Stay as far away from it as you can. Over these last three weeks, we've considered holy Christians in holy churches. What is What does God have to say to us about being a holy church? We've seen, as a reminder, in a holy church, faithful shepherds labor for the sheep. They lead the sheep and they teach the sheep. Faithful sheep respect and esteem their shepherd. Holy sheep admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted. They help the weak. They're patient with all, seeking to do good, never repaying with evil. That's how we are to respond to one another. Holy Christians and holy churches always rejoice, always pray, always give thanks to our chief shepherd. And when we hear our chief shepherd speak, holy sheep don't quench the spirit. We don't despise the word. And instead, we discern all things holding fast to what is good. Are you quenching the spirit today? Are you despising the word of God Perhaps someone is here and they're despising God's call to repentance. You're running and rebelling against your creator instead of surrendering to the Savior. I would plead with you today to repent of your sins. Call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved today. But perhaps you're quenching the Spirit. You're despising the Word of God by neglecting the Word of God. What God thinks and what God says is just an afterthought in your life. But today, you understand that the Spirit of God is urging you once again to commit your life to the Scriptures. You can grow in your love and your understanding of God's Word here at Rhema. It's our desire to be shaped by the Word, to be formed by the Word, and to submit ourselves to God's Word. What more can He say than to you He has said? Let's pray.